Hello everyone, uh, it's me Yuan again. So for this particular section, we'll actually be talking about the D part of the pharmacokinetics, namely the distribution. So we'll go through the, the names of the different compartments uh, whereby the drug can actually go and diffuse around and also the factors that actually influence the drug distribution. So about the compartments in the body is actually divided into different sections. So here we have to introduce you a concept called the bound drug molecules and also the free drug molecule. So what happens is that obviously a drug molecule is like a chemical structure floating around in the body, isn't it? So what happens is that it can easily bound and interact uh, with other protein molecules which are available in the body. So the binding can be just simple electrostatic ones because of the charges differences and so on so it's it could it may not be something very specific sometimes and it can be um it's not very strong bound so you, you bear in mind it's not like once it's bound it can it'll stuck there for a very long time actually not really uh, again depends on which drug you're looking at so uh, but the thing is once the drug is bound to another protein Right, whatever protein it is. So the structure of the drug changes as an overall, isn't it? So it becomes much bigger. So when it becomes much bigger, you ca it cannot actually diffuse across different cell membranes. It's basically just stuck at one section, uh, whichever section it is, uh, whether it's in the blood or it's already at different parts of the body. So for it to go around, go across different membranes, or to bind to its uh, pharmacological target, it has to be exists as a free drug molecule. Okay, so we've got plasma water, right? Uh, there's different waters in the body where the drug can sort of dissolve into it, inverted commas, right? So we've got um, plasma water in the plasma, in the blood, we've got intracellular within the cell, between the cells, and so on and so forth, right? So another compartment is the fat. So we can imagine that if the, if the molecule is very uh, lipophilic, very fat soluble so you stuck in it tends to stay in the fat uh, more easily compared to the others so this is the tag so for the different um, molecules that where it can go and also bear in mind some of the molecules they are very strongly bound to calcium protein so they tend to stay uh, in, in to deposit into the bone and the teeth compartment right so um, so here we're actually going to talk about four different types of distribution sites so basically, again, based on the different drug molecules characteristic, so some drug molecules tend to stay more within the blood, right, with minimal distribution to other tissues. So it can be good, for example, if you want the drug action to be actually at the endothelial cells, for example. There are some molecules that actually can distribute a little bit to the tissues, which is the second model, and the third model whereby it's equal distribution uh, for other tissues and uh, the blood, so meaning the concentration is the same with what you measure within the when you take the samples from the blood. And the last case is a bit extreme whereby the concentration that you measure um, in the blood is really low, but the concentration is, is very, very high in the other tissues. Because you, you can see uh, in this guy over here and also in the distribution photo over here. So therefore, you will get actually a weird number of volume distribution, which we're going to talk about again later on in the class for parameters of pharmacokinetics right so uh, this is so if you talk about VD just remember this four diagram so then you can roughly guess where the drug is actually at right so there's also something called distribution to the fetus right so if the mom is pregnant so um, and it's very interesting that uh, whereby the fetal blood is actually a little little bit more acidic than the mother so you can see the pH is about just a little bit more acidic compared to the mum, which is 7.4, so there's a 7 or 7.2. So if you go back, if you can still remember the henderson hasenbach equation, so some of the basic drugs would actually tend to stay in the fetal blood because of this slight difference. So it can be some, well, we call it iron trapping, but um, it's also called like, in, in a way, it's like slightly accumulation of the basic drug. So again, this will gain something they have to be careful, therefore, if the drugs could gain any harmful effects to the baby, it's actually the baby is actually more exposed to the drug actually. But there's also other factors like lipid solubility and so on, which influence the amount of drug which actually goes and accumulate in the baby. The next part, which talks about the other factors, is about the blood flow of uh, 
that goes to the different organs which may in, um, influence the distribution obviously the higher the blood flow then, then obviously the, the particular organ will be more exposed to the drug right because there's more blood flow through it because assuming the drug is accumulated and it goes around in the blood obviously right so the blood flow is actually highest in the kidney and livers that's no surprise isn't it so and it's lowest at all the other different organs right and obviously this muscles would be, could be lesser in the heart as well per se so if you actually look at the unit of blood flow liter per kg per minute right so um, if it's per kg obviously based on the size of the organ the kidney will be the winner lah, right because the kidney is the smallest organ in it compared relatively to the others but it has high blood flow so this is again just to remember uh, for western books they normally assume healthy volunteers at 7 kg, 70 kg Another factor that affects the distribution is called the capillary permeability. It refers to the gap junction, is, which is what we already mentioned a little bit earlier on. It's exactly the same point. So again, uh, the, the gap is huge in, uh, in for the vessels in the liver and the pancreas, uh, but it's the tightest at the blood-brain barrier, right? So, uh, but during the inflammation state, so uh, don't worry, the, the gaps will be bigger so that it's also good whereby the drugs that you deliver like antibiotics and things can penetrate into the brain more easily so that the, it can reach the target action in the brain, right? So there's also other stuff. So remember, there's also other transport like penocytosis across blood-brain barrier. Okay, for protein binding itself, it's what we mentioned earlier on about the bound drug and the free drug. So um, there's two main uh, proteins, plasma proteins, which is the most prominent one, which has a higher percentage. One is the albumin, another one is alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. So albumin per se uh, is mainly towards the acidic drug, right? So another one, alpha-1 acid glycoprotein is mainly towards the alkaline drug. So uh, a stupid, <laughs> a stupid, an easy lame way to remember is that the acidic is a shorter word than alkaline. So acidic, the short word, will bind to the shorter word of albumin. <laughs> so the alkaline one will bind to the longer word alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. Sorry, it's not, it's not the most funniest example. Right, so hopefully it helps you in the remembering of it. So uh, as you can see, actually the albumin is actually has a much higher concentration. Right, but uh, there's also other uh, components that can bind to, that a molecule can bind to, like estrogen, testosterone, or thyroid. So again, as a reminder, bound drugs are pharmacologically inactive because the size is way too big. Only the free drug can move around and act to the target. So move around. So there are other factors that influence protein binding. So remember, albumin has a very high percentage. So for diseases like hypoalbuminemia, like for people, e.g. example, people with nephrotic syndrome, for example. So nephrotic syndrome is whereby people have leakage at the glomerulus in the nephron. So what happens is that the person will actually lose protein uh, every time the person goes to be because it's a leaky membrane, right? So therefore, it will be lesser, so it will be lesser binding. So um, there's some disease when there's cancer and things that it actually increases the amount of proteins as well. So therefore, it has some effect on the drug concentration. But bear in mind, all these minor up and downs may not be important for all the drugs. It's only for very specific drugs, few drugs, which has... Uh, very very high protein binding and with some level of renal clearance so there's only very specific examples that the level of pro plasma protein will actually have a clinically important effect on the drug concentration so like the examples over here so these are the only few times that you may need to adjust uh, the dosing of the drug but not necessarily that you need to adjust the dosing for all the drugs when the person has such maybe a little bit of decrease in the protein levels right in the blood okay so um, here i'm just putting up some summary so this is just to show you that if you finish the whole class of pharmacokinetics these are the information that you should be able to understand when you look at it right again it's an introduction you don't need to know the, exactly how to calculate with calculation of exact values because all these different factors will actually influence uh, the design of the drug molecule Right, so when we do a drug screening, it's not necessarily that the strongest drug will actually reach the market, but it's the one which may be strongest, but if, if it has very strong first-pass metabolism, that everything goes wiped off. So you cannot use the exact same molecule. You need to do some chemical modifications, isn't it? So hopefully you understand the whole thing. So there's a bit of case history here, and hopefully uh, there's also answers. So 
you can try it out. Hopefully you understand them. Okay, have fun. Stay safe.